Okay, we can start. So the title of today's talk is Tips for Giving Good Talks. So I hope this will be a good talk. Yes, Professor Paul. Good. First of all, this is not my idea. Okay. Uh, so, if it's a bad talk, I'm not responsible. But if it's a good talk, the credit is mine. <laughs> um, so, let's not waste any time. Let's, let's start with the most important tip. The first and most important tip. Can you read it from the end? <laughs> you cannot. Okay. So, that's one thing. You should make things readable. Okay? And <clears throat> this tip is no one can teach you how to give good talks. You must learn on your own and find out what is best for you. It's a personal question which you should solve personally. So the conclusion is that the rest of this talk is irrelevant. <laughs> so what can be done actually in the rest of this talk? What anyone else can do for you is that they can share with you various experience which can provide food for your thoughts and food is always good and the more the experience the more the food okay so this explains why I have been chosen at age 62 there is only one person I think in this room who is older than me so why I have been chosen to give, give this talk? There is no claim that I can give very good talks. The only claim is that I have heard many bad talks. And so I know what not to do. So this is some of the things that I, I just want to talk about here. <coughs> so this is the plan for the talk. Initial joke. <laughs> it's already done. <laughs> the body of the talk and the final joke which is sometimes also called summary but uh, <clears throat> depending on the actual summary it can be more or less of a joke actually this outline is universal I mean it, it works for any talk so you can start any talk with this outline okay now the specifics for a talk is actually contained in the second part the body of the talk and for this talk the body is this first preparing for the talk number two designing on the contents number three preparing your slides number four some skills worth learning I mean skills that you don't learn when you are just writing a paper on a piece of paper and number five what are the things that you have to remind yourself at the time that you are giving the talk during the talk and number six is after the talk so it's very clear so we'll now go through these six points one by one so number point number one is preparing for the talk so first let us define what I mean by talk there are many kinds of talks and of course the strategies are different for different kinds so first of all there are two broad classifications one is pedagogical and one is a seminar in the first kind you are sort of trying to teach something to the audience in the second kind you are trying to inform something to the audience And uh, then among these two categories, there are also subcategories. Pedagogical talks can be either classroom talks when you are teaching a course, that is, or it can be some popular level talk when you are trying to reach an audience which is not very specialized in their training. Seminars can be a standalone seminar like for example this one there is no seminar before this one and after this one uh, or it can be a seminar in a conference 
in which case there are certain other things that uh, you have to keep in mind and the conference seminars also can be invited talks or contributed talks so we will talk about all of these kinds a little bit uh, but our main emphasis will be on seminars and standalone seminars but the other things will be talked about in a little bit so <clears throat> the first thing and I think it's the most important part of the preparation is that know thy audience. You'll have to know who you are talking to. So, in the, if you are talking, you're going to give a course, you are going to talk in the classroom, then the answer should be obvious. If you are teaching an MSc course, then you know that the students have already passed their BSc. Well, in confidence talks also. The answer is usually known from the announcement of the conference. If it says it's a conference on gravity and cosmology, you know that the people who will be there are specialists in gravity and cosmology. But for other kinds, it's a good idea to ask beforehand what the audience will be like. I usually send out an email like this. Number one, what will be the duration of the talk? Number two, what will be the language of the talk? I mean, this is not a question if, I, if it's a conference talk, but uh, other kinds or standalone seminars also, usually it's English always. But for popular talks, this can be, uh, the answers can be different from English. And number three, which is the most important part, what will be the composition of the audience? So, and then I mentioned, for example, the approximate relative numbers of students, researchers, faculty members, science, engineering, humanities. And these classifications can vary depending on when you are going to give the talk. Okay? So, it is best to, to give this, uh, to, to, to pose these as questions to the organizers so that you know who you are talking to. And accordingly, you should prepare your talk. The next point is choosing the topic. So the first question is are you presenting your work or are you reviewing some other people's work? Now for beginners, this talk is mainly for beginners. For beginners, it is advisable to present one's own work because then no one else is supposed to know it better than the speaker. Okay. So if it's your research, you know it best. No matter what other people say, you can just shut them up by saying that, no, no, we have done it and this is the answer. <laughs> Be very polite, but very, very, you know, strong in your work. But for an invited talk, it is best to propose a few topics and let the organizers decide. For example, uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, oh, actually just last week, I gave a talk in the Scottish Church College. Uh, the founder of Scottish Church College was Alexander Duff. And they now have a Duff Memorial Lecture. So I was asked to give the Duff Memorial Lecture. And when I was asked to do so, I sent uh, a message to the organizers saying that I am proposing three topics. So this is an example of how I propose the number one, history and mystery of calendars and then an abstract. I will discuss the main problems of calendrical astronomy, namely the units, day, month, year, etc, etc. I haven't written the full abstract. It's a, another few lines long. Not very long, because then the people will not have the patience for reading it. Okay, so just three or four lines abstract. Number two, terminology is in Indian languages. I will discuss how terminological words in science and other disciplines are created for Indian languages. Da, 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 da. Number three, wave particle duality and modern physics. Abstract. I will discuss how the corpuscular and wave pictures of matter and energy have developed. Da, 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 da. Now, as you see, this actually I was sort of, uh, I mean, I gave a lot of thought in proposing these three points. The first one, I would have thought that it will be, I mean, anybody will be interested. Anybody with an inquisitive mind, that is, will be interested no matter what the person's background is. The second one is sort of about science, 
but actually the, the pivotal role in this thing is not science but languages because the, it's the terminological words. Okay. So you have to know a little bit of science but not very much. It's a, how language works really. And the third one is really more into physics. So in a sense by proposing these three uh, topics, I'm also trying to understand what the audience will be like. If it were a physics audience, probably they would have chosen number three. If it were a sort of science, but not physics necessarily audience, they could have even gone for number two. And if it's an audience with science and humanities and everything, they will probably choose number one. So they chose number one, and I gave the talk last week. So it is better to to give such options so that you can you can get a feeling for the audience. Now the next thing is you have to be in the right frame of mind. Now you have to feel sort of enthusiastic about the talk. And although at the beginning of the talk I said that this is not my idea giving this talk, it was Koshik's idea. I, I didn't say Koshik in the beginning, but now I'm saying. Uh, but after he sort of proposed the idea, I sort of thought about it. And then at one point I felt that, okay, I feel enthusiastic about giving this talk. And at that point I said, yes, I will give the talk. But if you don't feel like giving the talk, you just come here and say, uh, build up a certain enthusiasm <laughs> in your mind that forget, don't give the talk. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the second thing is what I call the graduate student syndrome. When I was a graduate student, when I was doing my PhD, I had to give some kind of some talks in front of other students and also the, my professors. And I would always think that whatever I am going to talk about, my professor, professors know everything. That is not true. In fact, most of the professors know very little. <laughs> so so, so don't, don't assume that the professors know a lot. Uh, even if there are Nobel laureates in the, in the audience, uh, don't, don't assume anything. Whatever you think is, is the ideal audience that you have in mind, just uh, sort of uh, design your talk for that audience. Be confident without being arrogant. And then try to think beforehand the questions that might arise during the talk and prepare the answers. But don't give the answers during the talk. Okay. Now for beginners, a few extra ones. <coughs> Rehearse the talk. There is really no substitute for rehearsal. You have to rehearse the first time you go to give a talk and the second time and maybe also the third time. You have to rehearse the talk in front of your friends or even in front of an empty audience but rehearse the talk so that you at least time yourself you know how much time the talk is taking and so on especially if you are giving the talk in a conference it's very important to time yourself because otherwise <coughs> you are a new person so the chairperson will just take you and throw you out of the class okay. and then the second important thing plant some friends in the audience <laughs> who will ask <laughs> I might as well tell you, I was very good at this. <laughs> so I, I just tell my friends, okay, you know, whenever the questions will come, first thing you will ask this question. <laughs> and then I know the answer, but don't give the answer very quickly. <laughs> So, and then number three for beginners. I have suffered because I did not know this, but now I know this. But now I'm not a beginner. <laughs> Try to make the first one third of your talk accessible to everyone. The second one third accessible to specialists. And the third one third to none. <laughs> this third part I did not know when I was a student. And I suffer 
not very much for that because after I came out of the talk, everybody said, oh, that's a trivial talk. He's not doing anything. <laughs> so don't fall into that trap. And I am serious. Make it ununderstandable to everyone. That is important, very, very important. Now, choosing the right media for the talk. If it's a classroom, use Blackboard. I mean, there is no alternative. No matter what technology <coughs> does, technology invites this whiteboard, I, mean, I don't know, transparent boards, whatever, use Blackboard. And do not think even that writing on the Blackboard is just a waste of time. So you could have just, you know, write everything beforehand and just flash it. Because the time that you take in writing is also the time that the audience is taking, the students are taking for absorbing the material. And it's important to give them that time. So don't do anything other than that. If you have to show an experimental you know, arrangement which is huge, then don't draw it. Maybe just, just show a picture of it. That's fine. Or just you know, send your students a WhatsApp message beforehand so that they can see the picture before coming to the class. But otherwise, use the blackboard. If it's a seminar, it's a projection of computer file like what I'm doing now. And these days, almost there is no alternative to that. I mean, there are many places, especially conferences, that if you go to and if you just announce at the last moment that you want to use a blackboard, you probably see that there is no blackboard that you can use. Okay. So there is no alternative. You have to use this, this medium. <coughs> If you really want to give a blackboard talk, ask beforehand whether a blackboard is available. And if it's not a blackboard but a whiteboard, don't use it. That's very, very bad. I mean, maybe the first round of things you can write, but then you cannot erase it. So the second round will be superimposed on the first one, and nobody will be able to see. So, whiteboard is out. <coughs> For popular talks, you ask the organizers beforehand, the projectors are available if you want to use a projector. Not every place will have a projector. Okay. Blackboard is also not a viable solution because then the audience will think that it's like a classroom and that sort of violates the spirit of the talk. Okay. So you have to either you know project it or just be prepared to talk without any props at all. So just a hand waving talk. I mean, literally, hand waving. You just wave your hands and give it up. <laughs> now, for most of this talk, I will assume that the talk will be projected on a screen from a computer. And I will also assume, when there is a need for assuming the file type, that the computer file is a PDF file created with LUT. <coughs> Many comments will be independent of this assumption, but some comments will be dependent on. But actually, I recommend this this combination because this combination, these softwares are what what are called stable softwares. If you use other softwares, you will go to another place to give a talk and put your file in, in their computer, and then you will say the fonts are completely different. <laughs> okay, where where you had a bracket, there they have a P. <laughs> okay, so I mean you are completely at a loss and then they have version 7 but you have version 5 so the thing cannot project, so it's a mess. So don't use these other things which I am not naming. Now we go to the second, <coughs> second part. Deciding on the contents. Of course this is the most important part for a talk. But you can guess that this is where I have the list to say. In other words, how do I know what you are going to talk about? <laughs> Only you can decide. I can give you no, no hint about that part. But a few points are worth remembering. Number one, do not show long equations. You write a four line, five line, six line equation and flash it for you know, one second, nobody is going to digest it or even read it in that, that amount of time. If you have to use a long equation or you have to mention a long equation, then you use what I call is the Fermat excuse. You remember Fermat 
famously wrote in a margin of a notebook that I know a very nice proof of this theorem, but this margin is too small to write it down. <laughs> Just say that. This is a very long equation and a very illuminating equation, but this slide is too small to hold it. <laughs> yes, sir. Number two, do not flash any slide without stopping at it for some time. So some people just do it like this. This is the equation. This is the equation solution. What are you doing? Don't do this. And number three, do not show other people's slides or pictures. Okay, so somebody has you know drawn something in CERN and you are just showing it to, to make yourself promotion, that just doesn't look good. There are exceptions to this rule. As I said, for example, if you want to show experimental results in the form of a graph or something, then you cannot create the results. So you have to use the graph. Okay? But if you want to draw a Feynman diagram, you just copy it from somebody else's paper, it just doesn't look nice. You should do it yourself. Have a personal touch. And if you have to use something from other people, always, always mention the source. So that's all I can say about the contents. <coughs> Sorry, I cannot say anything more. I'm now going to the next part, which is preparing the slides. Now, first of all, in a slide, you have to choose the background. And the common mistake, the commonest mistake, is people choose a white background. And that's very, very bad. Why people make this mistake is that they're trying to emulate white paper. But these are not the same thing. A white paper doesn't emit light. It just scatters light. Whereas this screen is actually emitting light. So the light is coming to your eye and hitting your eye. Okay? So if you have a very bright screen, a lot of light falls on your eye. So your eyes get tired and then you get to sleep. <laughs> you have seen that happening to me many times <laughs> in recent times and that is the reason. Now I explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the solution is of course use dark backgrounds as I have done everywhere in this talk. You, you might, might have noticed already. If you haven't, just notice it from now on. The backgrounds are always dark and the, the fonts are light colored. I mean, <clears throat> if you want to appreciate the point, I, I will just let you look at the next two slides for 15 seconds each. And I have the stopwatch. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next one. Do I have to ask which one is more pleasant to look at? Yes. One thing is that uh, in this slide, what is happening, it is as if the constitution is going towards the background other than your content. That is what I mean in this presentation. So, if there are many equations, not just many statements, and there is a dark color, the dark color is grabbing more of my attention than your content. Don't take it Yeah, I mean, that is also the, the legacy of reading books. But you see, more and more people are not reading books at all. Okay, so this legacy will go away in a few years. Okay, there will be some people who have never read, who will have never read books in their lives. They will only look at computer screen. So it's better to have a dark computer screen and have the signal right on that. Now, choosing font colors. That is the four graphs. Golden rule for colors is of course on light background you use dark fonts, on dark background you use light fonts. But that brings the question what is light and what is dark? in terms of color. Of course, it's easy to say that white is light, black is dark. But what about blue or green or yellow, red, magenta, tan or amber and so on? 
So the answer to this question about the lightness and darkness of colors depends on how human eyes perceive colors. So let me get into this. Uh, so let's look at this picture. On the x-axis I have the wavelength of light in nanometers. This is 400 and this is 700 nanometers. So this is the, these two are the boundaries of what our eyes can see. And this is the absorptivity. There are three kinds of molecules in our eyes which absorb light. And this is the relative absorptivity. This is A, molecule A. I, I, I don't remember the names. The, the organic molecules are too difficult, difficult for me. Okay. The names, I mean. <coughs> so there's a molecule A which absorbs like this, which peaks around 600 nanometers. There is another which is B, which uh, peaks around 550. And then there is a C, which, whose absorptivity is uh, small and it picks around 450. And the combination of this thing gives us the sense of light. For example, if we can sense that we are seeing uh, most of the light from A and a little bit, maybe 20% from B and then nothing from C, then we would imagine that this is the wavelength of light which is coming to us and so on. Okay. Now, <coughs> compare this spectrum with uh, blue, this is blue, green, yellow, red. And this uh, background thing, the magenta background, is the sum of these three curves. The, norm the normalization is unimportant, the normalization just tells you the in about the intensity of the light. The color is not given by the normalization. So I normalized everything to 1. So now look at this. If you look at the green one, and remember that this magenta thing at the, at the, at the back is the white light. <coughs> so here if you get everything, then it's white light. So the green one has a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, lot of intersection with the white light. The yellow also has a lot of intersection with the white light. So these are the colors which are close to white light. Now, remember, when I say green light, it's not a monochromatic green light. Okay? It's a green light with some spread in the wavelength. So in fact, I have just drawn some Gaussians to make the point. So a green will have a lot of overlap with the white. <coughs> Yellow will have a lot of overlap with the white. But the blue and the red will have very little overlap with the white. Rather, if you look at the overlap, Blue and the red are closer to black because black means nothing. Black is the x-axis. Okay, so the lesson that we learned is that green and yellow they are close to white, so they must not be used on light backgrounds. And the red and blue are closer to black, and so they should should not be used on dark backgrounds. In fact, you can see here that I have written the letter, written the word blue in blue, but you can hardly see it because it's on a, and red also certainly you can see the green and the yellow much better than you can see the red. So based on this graph, I can't understand what you mean by overlapping with white. Okay, so it means that if you get uh, this kind of response total in the wavelength, then you will call it white light. White light doesn't mean that all the wavelengths are coming with the same amount, of the same amount, okay? White light means that you are uh, getting this kind of a response of, from different wavelengths. Now the response of green is close to that. Not the same, but close. There is a lot of overlap. So it is easy to confuse green with white or not so easy to see the green against the white. Okay? Is that clear? Yeah. So, uh, so this is about uh, green, red, blue, yellow. What about other colors? For other colors, it's it's uh, good to know the color names. 
how a computer identifies colors. Any color in a computer is created by mixing three colors R, G, and P, red, green, and blue. So one takes just a, a typical thing from here and one from here and one from here. <coughs> three wavelengths. Okay. Now the amount that they mix, for example, if I want to create the sense of a, uh, of a, let's say 600 nanometer thing and I have a 650 or 680 nanometer red and a 550, I just mix the, the amount such that it gives uh, exactly the, the same ratio of A and B as uh, 600 nanometer gives. Okay? So, so this is the idea. So you mix the uh, three primary colors RGB in the right proportion or their uh, complements. The complement of red is uh, cyan and this is magenta and this is yellow and this is black. Nobody knows why black is written with K. Uh, my hypothesis is that those people are secretly using Bengal. <laughs> Okay, so uh, how the computer identify colors? Red will be called 100 in RGB units or RGB axis if you want to say. 100, so it's red and no green, no blue. Sometimes it is also normalized to 255. That is in hexadecimal uh, numbers. Hexadecimal numbers, it will be FF. Hexadecimal means that there, is, there are 16 basic numbers, 1 to 15, uh, sorry, 0 to 15. Okay? So you have the usual symbols for 1 to 9 and then A, B, C, D, E, F. So A means 10 and B means 11, etc. F means 15. So F, F means uh, this is 15 and this is 15. So 15 times the 16 plus 15, which is 255. So red will be FF0000, so the first two belongs to red, the second two to green, the third uh, pair to blue. So green will be 010 or two Fs in the middle and so on. White will be 111, everything F. <coughs> yellow will be a mixture of red and green. As you see here also, the, 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 the yellow comes uh, in between red and green, red is here, green is here, in between there is yellow. So yellow is a mixture of uh, red and green, so that will be FFFF. FF. Pink for example, if you want to make pink, then pink will be, of course, the dominant thing will be red. But it will not be really red like this, but it will be somewhat red towards the white. Okay, so the in the red the green and the blue components were zero but now the green and blue components will not be zero they will be somewhat you know bigger than zero and depending on how much bigger you will get different kinds of pink very dark pink or very light pink or whatever and so on and so forth you can do it the same way with the cmyk the cmyk will be just the opposite if uh, rgb is 100 then CMYQ will be 0, 1, 1. Okay? And so on. Now, you see that the middle one is green. And as you saw here, that the green is the green is the dominant thing. Green, yellow, this part, the absorptivity is, is highest. So if you see a color where the, the middle one is large compared to the two side ones, then that color will be very light. If you want to have dark colors, then you have to have the, the, the two side numbers have to dominate. So this is the this is the idea. So now you can create your own color also in the computer if you want. In fact, many of these colors in which I am showing the, the the slides, for example, this color, this I have created. I have just asked the computer to, to make some some particular combination of RTV and make this color. After the color, the font shape and size. First of all, shape. Use heavy fonts. They look better on slides. What is meant by heavy? 
the answer is if you write a paper, uh, I mean write on a piece of paper, sorry, with a certain font, you write some text, okay, let's say that you are writing the, the first page of War and Peace, okay, so you write it with one font, you write it with another font. Now the same amount of <coughs> white is not darkened by the, by the two fonts, right? So the more dark color you will have, the font will be called a heavier font. So for example, a bold font is heavy, heavier than the normal font. Okay? But even without the bold, the, some fonts are heavier than some other fonts. I will show you some examples. The other thing is, uh, I very personally feel very strongly against fonts without serifs. Uh, the serif is this little, just a little mark at the at the end of the lines. These are called serifs. Okay. <coughs> there are fonts without serifs. For example, these ones, as you see, the, the uh, lower case L and the upper case I, they look the same in without serif fonts. So I don't like it. I mean, for a long time after I went to the United States, I didn't, I couldn't pronounce the the name of the state Illinois because I have seen it written in. Uh, sans serif fonts and it's I L L but it looks to me I I I and I didn't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> so, so I think uh, one should always use fonts with self. Examples of font shapes. See, this is the CMR font, Computer Modern Roman. This is the this is the default font for LaTeX. So this is an example of a text written with uh, CMR. I think the CMR is not good enough for slides. CMR is good for uh, hard copies. But for slides, the better font is a new set font. And this is an example. Uh, I think you can probably see that, that this is a heavier font than the CMR. I mean, look at this P and this P, for example. You can understand that this is a heavier. The times. Roman is, is lighter than the CMR. In fact, this is the reason that uh, Donald Truth didn't originally use Times Roman for scientific writing. He just uh, created the CMR fonts. And this is the Helvetica, which is a uh, sans serif font, without serif font. This is like this. I have already recommended against it, but you know, uh, if you really like it, you can use it. But some things will be confusing there. So uh, for LaTeX, I think my vote goes to new send forms. If you want to create uh, slides, use the new send or find someone which is as heavy as new send. The size. <coughs> About the size, I, I only need to remind you uh, what is called the parable of prompts. Has anybody here heard the parable of prompts? I suspect not, because it happened to me. It is not a parable from the Bible or anything. It is when I was I was living in the United States, and I once I went to the supermarket to buy some grocery, and I was uh, very pleased to see some uh, prompts which had been sold. So, uh, so I. I I was thinking uh, of buying it, and there are prompts of three different sizes. Now, of course, the bigger size would cost more, and so after some time, I decided that I would buy the smallest size because that is the cheapest. That is what I can easily afford. So I asked the person that uh, give me prompts. I mentioned some weight, and so he said, "Which one?" And then I said, "The small." And said, that's no small. I said, why this is small? He said, no, this is large. <laughs> I said, then what is the next one? He said, oh, that's called giant. <laughs> <laughs> and now I thought I have come to the end of my patience. But I still ask them, what is the next one? He said, oh, that's Palooza. <laughs> so this is the parable, and as you know, every parable has a moral. The moral of this parable 
is that sizes which some people think large are actually small, or sizes which some people think small are actually large. So sizes which are large for writing things in a hard copy are actually about the smallest size that you can use on a slide. They are the small for the slides. And I will show you an example of large. This is a large. Can you see it? If not, I have made my point. Okay. Then this is the one which is in like a large with a capital L. This one is also too small. This is a large with full capital. This is the one which is I think is okay. And in fact, this is the size which I have used. So the large is the smallest size and if you want to go even higher, you can use the huge. Huge is a built-in latex size which comes. But then if you really want to, you know, remember the, the prawn seller in the supermarket and want to use the gigantic or the colossal, then you have to create them yourselves. But fortunately creating the fonts in something like latex is very easy. It's not very easy in, in some other uh, softwares. For example, this gigantic font I have created just by saying, giving this command backslash font gigantic equal to CMR10 scale 3500. CMR10 would normally produce a 10 point font. But if I scale it 3500, that means it's scaled by, I mean, this is 3500, uh, I mean, this means by 3.5 times it will uh, magnify the font. So it will make it a 35 point font and that's gigantic. If I want to make it 55, I have to say scale 5500 <coughs> and so on. Uh, we are saying this everything in terms of points. The point is the printer's unit, which I believe these days everybody knows, but I have just uh, written it down here for the sake of completeness. One point is roughly 1 over 72 inches or 1 over 28 centimeters. So, uh, the large is 14 points usually, uh, but uh, that is too small as I said. You have to start using from here. <coughs> so now I go to the section which is skills worth learning. I mean skills which you do not have if you always write things on paper. Okay. Number one is changing colors in a postscript file. This is an easy skill. And I think everybody should have it, have this skill. For example, I showed you this, uh, this picture before, and this is how the picture originally came from a, a GNU plot. But I have changed it to look like this, so that you can read the, the, the things here and also see the axis. How do I do it? It's actually very easy. In the postscript file, say in LaTeX you have a backslash which starts a definition or a command. In a postscript file, it's a regular slash, the front slash, which defines the command. So in the postscript file that was created by GNU plot, I just first of all found that when I am when this thing is written, wavelength is nanometers, what is the color that it's using? So it says LCA set RGB color. So I know that it is using a color which is called LCA, okay. So where is LCA? Before that in the file I found that it is defining the color LCA which is 000. zero, zero. Now remember the color name, <coughs> zero, zero, 000 means black. So it is writing in black. So what I did, I didn't change the definitions. Well I did. I I actually instead of using LCA, I asked it to use LC5. And LC5 is 1.5.5. So this is like pink that we have shown before. I uh, have to go too far back. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so this is pink. So that is what is appearing. So always in the postscript file, you can identify the where the color is set and where the color is defined. So just go ahead and change the names of the colors. And that way, you'll be able to produce fonts, uh, produce uh, pictures which you will actually be able to show on the dark background. There are also uh, some finer points of LaTeX which I think should be kept in mind. For example, do not give equation numbers. 
It's useless. In the middle of the talk, you cannot say in equation 17, we have proved. Nobody knows where equation 17 was by that time. Okay. So don't give equation numbers. Just when you are saying begin equation or begin equation array, just put a star. That will forbid the numbers. Do not also give figure numbers or table numbers for the same reason. Okay. As shown in figure 3, you cannot say in the middle of a talk. Okay. And also remember that putting a figure or a table does not really require a begin figure or a begin table command. In fact, you should not use such commands. Just include the figure. Include graphics or whatever command you have. Just say that, but don't say begin figure, begin table, etc. Because these are float commands. They will not only include the figure, but it actually also uh, decides on the position in the figure. Okay. But actually here you don't need it to position, you want to control the position. Okay? So that's why you should not use this float commands. Do not use cross-referencing as I just said. Uh, and if it's necessary to go back to a previous equation, just use hyperref. Hyperref creates links from one place to another. So if I am here and press on the hyperref uh, thing, it will go back to equation 3 or whatever equation you want and then you can come back ok so study the hyperref package it's a very easy package and you can use the hyperref if you want use display style to control the size of the fractions for example if you want to write v square over c square without the display style it will come out like this and it will hardly be noticeable from the back but with, with display style it will be like this which is much better you have to agree ok so, and then I already told you that use the package new sent so that the ordinary text appears bolder and also use the package Euler so that the math mode text appears bolder. The usual math mode text is not good for projection uh, purposes. Uh, with Euler, it becomes much better. Now, what are the things that you have to keep in mind during the talk? First, the beginning. <clears throat> Go to the lecture hall a little before, before the audience, and test your five words with a combination of computer and projector. As many of you know, I have come here before you came, and many of you know that I have come here after you came. Okay, <laughs> so I am in the middle. Attract the attention of your audience by something distinctive at the very beginning, maybe with a joke or with an anecdote or whatever. Okay. I hope you remember that I have followed this rule. I started with a joke. If it's a short talk, say 30 minutes or less, do not start with an outline of the talk. You don't have time to waste. In fact, I think the outline should be avoided even in an hour-long talk. If a person cannot remember for one hour what I am talking about, what's the point of giving the outline? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like that story, you know, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a car which came from the back and hit the, the, the back of a truck. And the truck was going to turn left. So the, the case went to the judge <clears throat> and the judge said, why did you hit the car? He said, I thought the truck was going to turn right and so I was going from the left. And so then the asked, so then the judge asked the truck driver, didn't you show him some signal with hands or something? So then the truck driver said, the person who could see the truck. <laughs> <laughs> the person will not remember. Forget the person. <laughs> but I suspect that you remember that I have violated this rule in this talk. I have given you an outline. I am very sorry for that. I should not have. There are some audio aspects, I think, that you should remember. Never refuse a microphone. This is a very important thing. Reasons. <coughs> Number one, machoism is no good. <laughs> And if you think it's a sexist comment, if it applies only to men, I can make it for women also. I guess the word will be machaism. 
Okay. <clears throat> I mean, you, you don't know when you are starting the talk how your voice is going to hold after 30 minutes or after 45 minutes, and you don't know the condition of the of the of the place that you are talking, the the acoustics of the of the room, and so on. How much you have to scream and so on. So never refuse the microphone. Number two is at the, even at the beginning, people usually the, the ends of the syllables. Are the ends of the sentences? Are you really less? <laughs> so this is what happens. So, but the, those parts also deserve to be heard. So, use the microphone. I mean, the moral is: when a microphone is offered to you, do not say that. Am I audible? <laughs> There are two reasons why you shouldn't say it. One is it is a bad decision, as I have already explained. The second thing is it is a bad English. Okay? I mean, in Bengali, you know, don't say Amiki Sabbo. you know, uh, done any oration before, it's something that you should practice. You should recite poems at home or, you know, take some uh, script or some nice play and just read it aloud and so on. <coughs> or, not or, and listen to some people whose pronunciation is great. And I have three people in mind. One is Shomitra Chattva. Number two is Michael Douglas, and number three is Michael Caine, not in any order. Those three, to me, absolute beautiful pronunciation. I remember one day I, I, I bought a CD, this was the time of CDs. I bought a CD of the movie Orunet Dindrati from just roadside, from the you know, Inez planet. And the CD must have been damaged, so when I came home and you know put it on our CD player, you could see the uh, picture, but all the sound was like <laughs> it was like this. And then after three minutes or so, Shomitra Chattavadha came in and he said something and that was clearly, clearly understandable. He was the only person understandable in the whole movie. Okay. So, <clears throat> very beautiful pronunciation and notice how they pronounce the end of words. This is very important. It's a skill which should be. Uh, attain. And uh, as I have told you, you should so, show some enthusiasm or eagerness for, while you are talking. So not in a very flat tone or very dissociated tone or whatever. Learn the pronunciation of the scientist's names that appear in your talk. Okay. If there is Einstein's name and you don't know how to pronounce it, and you say Einstein, I mean, people say that you are no good. Okay. Common mispronunciations are Schrodinger's name. Many people call it Schrodinger, but there is no jar. Okay. Feynman, I know that this name is very much mispronounced after I came back to India from the US because when I was, before I was doing my BSc and MSc, the name of Feynman never came up. And after he came back, I found that many people call him Pain Man, Pain Man, and there were a lot of things. But his name is Fine Man. Nice person. <laughs> don't spoil this nice name. Richie, many people call it Ricky, that's completely ununderstandable. Okay? And remember that these names, I mean, you can just learn the pronunciation from the internet also. So just go to the Wikipedia and, and hit the button. <laughs> and, 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 and you get the name of a Japanese scientist, don't say that these Japanese scientists are true. They have a name. <laughs> so you say, Akura has two. Or Akutu has two. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. I mean, this is not really during the talk, but during the talk, you, you, you will realize how much this is important. So I have put it here. Pronounce everything beforehand. I'm not saying each and every word you have to pronounce beforehand, but the words which where it, where mistakes might be made, those words rehearse at home, pronounce them beforehand. Okay. So be careful about, for example, word boundaries. I mean, if you don't remember the word boundaries, then you know, instead of therapist, you just put the word boundary. <laughs> Changing the title of the talk. <coughs> Remember what was the title of the talk? Tips for giving good talks. It's not tips for giving good talks. <laughs> I'm not asking for forgiveness or giving forgiveness. Okay. So you should also know the hyphenation boundary. Then mis mistakes happen there. Instead of saying I resent your article, if you don't, if you forget about the hyphen <laughs> and write I is the you are going to create any mess. Do not stumble on long or unusual words or names copied from somewhere else. This is a common mistake. People just copy things from whatever and then they come to the thing and say, oh, by the God. <laughs> so do some practicing with the tongue. I mean, pronounce things like this. The upper flu has. Infatuation of Akbar, Dorbendikali Lasita is the Dorbendism of Humayu. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of word. Uh, it should be practiced. Even Michael can not say that. Even Michael can not say that. But show me to Jatubar, that can. So, um, you know where this appears? This appears in Ravindranath's last prose book, which is called Balpo Shabdi. There is a guy whose name is uh, what is his name? <coughs> Bachashpati, who is creating a, a new language. And his idea is that uh, the words need not be explained, the words should express themselves. So he says, if I write the Habbat was infatuation of Akbar, Darwin declared as a Taj, the Garbantism of Humayun, nobody will ask the meaning. But the meaning is obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so anyway, this is just an aside. <coughs> Time management. This is a very important thing. What are your options? If you reach near the end of your allotted time, as I have and find that there is still a lot of material to be covered. I don't have a lot, but I have some. What do you do? There is a whiz solution. So, just go to a whiz. So, instead of pronouncing them clearly, you just have to That's it. The problem with this solution is that you are almost surely losing your audience. The audience have no idea what you are talking about or what you are talking. There is this Gerosh's law. Robert Gerosh was a Chicago professor who gave this law. The efficiency of a talk is determined not by the amount of information emitted by the speaker, but by the amount of information absorbed by the audience. So if you are going fast, the absorption rate is very low. So it's a bad talk. Other solution is the bait solution. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best solution when you are giving an isolated seminar. But if you are talking in a conference, this is absolutely forbidden. Because then you are eating up other people's time. And if you are a beginner or a very young person, you are likely to be thrown out. The bulldog solution. <laughs> Make no compromise on your speed or material anything. <laughs> The problem is after 10% extra time, the audience thinks that you haven't put enough thought into your preparation. After 20%, they think you are inconsiderate. After 30%, they think you are a masoch you are masochistic. After 33 and one third percent, they start. <laughs> There's a prevention solution also. Prevention is always better than cure. So how can you prevent some ideas? Don't 
don't try to give the full war and peace of Mahabharata in your talk. <coughs> a good talk is not a talk that contains a mountain of material. It's a talk that inspires the audience to think about the subject of your talk. It doesn't even have, it doesn't, shouldn't even have all the answers to all the questions. This is raising the questions are enough to, to, to make it a good talk. Mark some point in your slides where you should reach, where you should reach at half time. And ask the timekeeper, for example the chairperson, to give you a warning at half time. If it's a one hour talk and you get a warning five minutes before the talk and if you have half of the talk left, it doesn't help. So get a warning a long time before you have to stop. Carry a stopwatch and put it in front of you and check the time periodically. <laughs> if you encounter a question during your talk and feel that the answer will jeopardize your time plan, say that you will answer it at the end of the talk. And if there are too many questions during the talk, Stop all of them by saying that again. I will answer everything after the talk. So, <clears throat> so this way you can sort of go according to a plan and finish it in time. Page numbering might help, no? As you did. Yes, that's that's a good point. Uh, when I said this half half, <laughs> when you reach at half time, it's sort of half the number of pages should be half time. <clears throat> okay. Now after the talk. After the talk, of course, comes the questions. What are the types of questions? <laughs> First type is reasonable. <laughs> Try to answer them with care. Never say this question is trivial or stupid. In fact, trivial questions, as I told you before, is good. They are good for you. You answer them with great care and spend a lot of time. On them. <laughs> so, <clears throat> second is irrelevant questions. The most common is specifically on popular level task. So, do you believe that God exists? <laughs> no matter what you are talking about. This is, you know, it's going to come. This question is going to come. Then there is something called, what I call Salam's problem. It is in Salam's Nobel lecture. Salam says that Rudolf Pires asked him a question during his PhD examination. <coughs> And Salam later in his Nobel lecture he says, I had then felt somewhat uncomfortable at Pyers. I mean, if you know Salam, this is one way of saying that I felt well disgusted about the question. Okay? Uh, at Pyers, asking for a PhD viva, a question of which he himself said he did not know the answer. So if you can guess, the person who is asking doesn't know the answer also. Okay? But he is just trying to test you or trying to show that he or she is very knowledgeable about the subject. There are ways to deal with these things. With then there are very long questions. Usually they come from people who want to give a talk at the cost of your talk. <laughs> <laughs> so just stop them in the middle by saying, I oh, I understand that's the point you are making. And then let me answer it. And then start giving the answer. Don't let them finish because they'll never finish. <laughs> And then there are multiple questions. Try to avoid getting into them. These are dangerous. If you see them coming, just announce that you would rather have one question at a time. If they arrive before you suspect, just wait till the end, give the answer to the last question, and then say, I have forgotten the other. <laughs> so, now how to tackle questions? Of course, if, you, if it's a reasonable question and you are supposed to know the answer, just answer it, honestly. But know that there will be unreasonable questions. So be prepared with some answers that work even if you don't understand the question. For example, the jargon answer. Question, in your opinion, what is the reason that the common people know so little about politics and are not interested to know more? So you think about it and say, I think the main reason is their ignorance and apathy. 
She said, just restate the question. <laughs> but we have to restate it with more <laughs> impressive words. <laughs> Number two, the haze answer. Question, can you please elaborate on your solution of the XYZ problem? Answer, you see, the deeper problem is undoubtedly very difficult. <laughs> Solution. No, it works and it works well. But then, of course, other difficulties are welcome. And hopefully, we'll be able to reach a conclusion in the end. <laughs> so, it says nothing. <laughs> While be prepared to say that I don't. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Ignorance may, be, may not be a bliss everywhere, but it is never a crime. So, if you think that there is a reasonable question and you don't know the answer, <coughs> you don't. I think we should respect you for that. Well, income tax department, there's <laughs> last one. <laughs> They were not included in my definition of talks. <laughs> anyway, as I said, it's, it's be prepared to say I don't know, and uh, at this point, I really don't know what else I can say. So that's the final joke. <laughs> Would you like to take some questions? <laughs> <laughs> I have already given the answers. <laughs> I think the next speaker will be in, in pressure, like Pijuzda. You have to you know, change your mind. My joke. Come on, <laughs> Yeah, no, I said now that you are giving a suggestion about how the slide should be made, we used to be in trouble because he has already prepared his slide and he has to change. <laughs> change the background, the foreground and all these things. Good that your talk was not yesterday. We went to an important mission yesterday night yeah. and Pijusda would have been absent. I we wanted him. <laughs> I mean, you, would have, okay, you, you would have spent the time to very hyphenate. You have any plan to give like how to be a good audience in a science conference? Like this how to be a good audience. Because most of your slides will you not know, prepare the hostile people who are sitting in front and who doesn't give time to especially the black students and postdocs. Whenever people like you give a talk, even there is a question, people will think twice. But if I am giving the talk, three people will jump on me. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't make it personal. <laughs> It took me 62 years to give this talk. Maybe the other 62 years I will end up in that one. So you also mentioned one question, but you failed to ask. I mean, sorry, you could only forgot to answer this. That is, uh, how to deal with people who are asking you questions? Who, who, that frankly, they are trying to harass you. Yeah, I am very frankly. Suppose somebody tries to harass you. Wait, wait. By making some easy thing quite difficult. Number two, by asking questions, they do not know the answers. So, how to deal with Yeah, I mean, these are the things that, that I will say. Hey, what is the second point? No, you can see two person nervous by saying something. But I mean, I mean even since when a person is, you know, 
The jumping on you is the sense that the person, <coughs> whether he has an honest question, or he or she has an honest question or is just trying to harass you, right? So if the person just says, I have two questions, they said, okay, can you please answer, uh, can you please ask the second questions first? <laughs> so he immediately gets answered. <laughs> <laughs> Try to unnerve the person. <laughs> that's, that's one thing you can repeatedly do. And then the other solution for these things uh, that I showed you, the health solution and the Jargon solution. Those can be used anywhere, any place. <laughs> but you have to know, you know, some some jargon words. Use them. One of the answers I once heard is that I didn't understand your question, but the answer is no. <laughs> this is a good one. This should have been included. Yeah. No, not or whatever the question is, answer is no. I yeah, yeah. So P.J. Shri should include it in the written order. Sir, no, or I did not understand the question, but, and whatever you know, on, a, on any of the words related to your talk, uh, to the talk. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Sir, so what about the reference slide? Some people give yeah, reference slide and these are my references. Reference are not even able to read the reference. It is just to show I have read a lot. Yeah. <laughs> actually, <laughs> yeah. actually I, I have never had that problem because I read very little. <laughs> but then, um, yes, I know there are some people who read. I, I really don't like giving references in, in talks. Okay, but uh, all you can say is that if you want the references, I can give it uh, to you, you know, privately. Or, you know, you can send me an email and I'll give you the references. So giving a talk, unless it's uh, you know somebody's solution, you know, the Schwarzschild solution. Okay, then you have to uh, mention the name of Schwarzschild. There is no other way of uh, talking about it. So if it's already or the this guy Malgachena's conjecture. Okay. So this thing, in a sense, that the name is sort of giving reference. There you have to do it. Otherwise, there is no point. So, yeah. So basically, uh, so one problem what we feel like a new faculty. So when you are starting the lab, then definitely you are exploring uh, two or three things together. Now, when if it is a forty minutes or one hour talk, the one question so we all, I mean, personally, I ask like, how many story? In a talk, one I mean, audience can actually absorb. Uh, basically, that's uh, how many what? How many stories? But it should be a one story through the whole talk, or it's better. Or because our problem is we are just exploring. We don't know <coughs> where we we'll reach. Uh, so we have two or three stories. And uh, stories mean subject, uh, avenues, yeah. three avenues on the okay. avenues of this side. So <laughs> is it, if I if they're really if they're not related a little bit, but they are yeah, related. if they're not related, giving a talk becomes difficult. Somehow you have to find some unifying thing because otherwise it is difficult also for the audience to change gears. You know, you know, if you talk about something and then you, you, know, you, you switch to something, but the audience cannot switch so quickly. So you have to sort of put something in an envelope, and you have to present that envelope. I, I mean, I really don't know how generally I can make that comment, but personally I feel that way sitting on the other side. I mean. How to be a good audience? That 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 thing. I would feel much better if there is any fine thing in the talk. <coughs> One thing I found it really helped. I mean, when, a, when you are giving a talk in a, a small audience, uh, <coughs> if you try to set con, you know, eye contact with few people in the first or second row, and it's some kind of a psychological game. When you nod, I mean, they also you know resonate. Accordingly, it really helps. It really helps. Um, about about then I mean, people find it difficult to deny. I mean, they are already in So if you have, if you have agreed ten times, then eleventh time, okay, they are But 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 about, about nodding, I, I should tell you one one incident that uh, when I was in Carnegie Mellon and um, there I had to uh, appear in my what is this called the qualifying exam. The qualifying exam for, for those who haven't heard this term is, is uh, they can ask questions about anything. Yeah. I mean anything about physics, not, not something else. Anything about physics. Okay. So there is no no syllabus. Anything they ask. So 
So uh, there is a written part and then there is a presentation part. So the presentation part, um, everybody will have to go and give a talk and then the professors will ask you questions. Now, the person who would later be my advisor, Lincoln Wolfenstein, other students told me, my friends told me that keep an eye on Wolfenstein. Okay, so and I actually did that. Somebody asked me a question, so I start answering very slowly and then I look at Wolfenstein. And if Wolfenstein is big, <laughs> then I know that I am not in the right. And if Wolfenstein is big, <laughs> then continue. So it, it worked very well. <laughs> so, yeah. So you have to have a standard kind. You have to have a standard kind. So. But, but go to, I, I should also, also, also tell you that the, the, the reverse policy is also um, uh, advocated many times. Not to look at anybody, but look at just, uh, just about, you know, half a meter above the last person in the... That is when you are giving some kind of a review talk or a popular talk or something. But when you are, when you are trying to sell your ideas, Try you need some kind of eye contact. Eye contact helps. Only the small audience. No, but then the main problem comes for the beginners. For them, when they see a full audience, most of the beginners get nervous. That it's such a when you know so many people. You go na. Jo daiga, I nervous na. You go nervous, then nothing can help you. Okay. The, the whole point is so that you don't get nervous. Well, sometimes the eye contact can be quite distracting too. Depends on who's, who is sitting there. Uh, <laughs> that was a fine note. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say, but don't do that. I hope you have a good time. 